So, yes, thank you for the introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, I will not, I'm not going to speak on art. I'm going to speak on images, and for this differentiation, it's very, very important. Not every work of art is an image, and not every image is a work of art. I would like to ask and discuss with you a rather simple question, namely, why and when image is a fictional image. I would like to discuss with you the question, what is a fictional image? For example, this image, and I shut this down a little bit. For example, this image. The picture is a photograph showing the secret agent James Bond. And the novel on James Bond, or the films of name, on, on James Bond, we would call fictional. It's a fictional person. Consequently, it is obvious to say that this is a fictional image. But why and when can we say that this picture shows John Connery? This is precisely the problem. It could just be well uh, be said, this picture shows Sean Connery in his prime time, a very real actor, as we know. Then the picture is anything but not a fictional picture. I have to put this a little bit in front, otherwise it's too dark. I can't read. Oh, yeah, now it's perfect. Thank you. Oh, perfect. Oh, let's take another example. This. <sighs> Should this be taken as a fictional picture, fictional image, because there is no such looking woman? People who look like this are completely fictional. On the one other hand, Picasso himself claims that this is a portrait of Dora Ma, a woman who existed during Picasso's lifetime. If this is so, this picture would not be a fict fictional picture, but perhaps disfiguring extreme portrait. Now, one might think that there is an extensive discussion or extensive research literature on exactly this problem, but it is not the case. The topic, ladies and gentlemen, of fictional images, quite different, just the opposite to fictional literature, is hardly Discussed hardly receives any attention. I just found one article. There's no monographic work on fictional images. I think there is a good reason for it. Why do we not have an extended research on fictional images? Because if you look to this image theory, to this research, there is a very widespread opinion, a strange opinion, that you don't find in the same way for the spoken language. The philosophical image theory, in philosophical image theory, the opinion is widespread that every image, qua image, is a fiction. So we are dealing with a view that is hardly ever found in this form with regard to language. Perhaps Friedrich Nietzsche, perhaps, or strange postmodern philosopher would have held the analogous opinion that is, he would have said, every speech is a fictional speech. But normally, if you go in a library, you have a section fictional literature and non-fictional literature. It's an absolute normal differentiation. For most theories, it is self-evident that in principle one can divide the set of texts or literature into fictional and non-fictional um, texts. But that does not mean that every text is fictional. It is a different story in image theory. Absolute opposite, and that's a strange situation. Indeed, one must note, and perhaps with surprise, that at least two of the most famous and influential image theories of the 20th century have argued strongly for the view, in fact, that every image is a fiction. I'm thinking here, on the one hand, of the father of phenomenology, Edmund Husserl, who advocated uh, this view at the beginning of the 20th century, and on the other hand, of the US-American philosopher Kendall Walton, 
who in turn made this view famous at the end of the 20th century. Normally, and this is a good thing, these two philosophers are not put in one jar. They are quite different. Their views of images are diverse. But the huge differences in their theories should not make us overlook the fact that in the end, the same opinion is defended by both regarding the question, what is a fictional image? And the thesis is, all pictures are showing fictionous things. If one takes this view in the background, and if you think that is a normal view, then it becomes understandable why we do not have a research of fictional images that would be strange. Yeah? You do not, uh, uh, man hat keine Forschung über Dreiecke, ob sie dreieckig sind, weil alle Dreiecke sind dreieckig. Yeah? If one believes, as Kendall Wharton explicitly writes, that images are, quotation, fictions by definition, then talking about fictional images makes as much sense as talking about round circles. Images are always fictions in this theory, and I want to say, not only in this series, in such a sort of mainstream. And I think it's not so often that the mainstream has a weird opinion. From Husserl's and Wharton's point of view, and thus in large parts of philosophical image theory, the study of images is nothing other than the study of a particular form of fiction formation. Image theory is fiction theory. I would like to take the opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, to present to you Wharton's and Husserl's reasons for their views. For indeed, it seems to me that here we find a continuing seminal contribution to the fictionality of the image. The argumentation is based on the fact that three fundamentally different aspects of an image can be distinguished. Indeed, must be distinguished if one wants to speak precisely about images. These three aspects, that's the basis, and I would say the basis of every image theory today, is image carrier, image object, and image subject, and a ring. Take, for example, the picture showing the fabulous saxophonist, Georgia Shalvas. Is everyone, uh, is someone knowing her? It's one of my favorite saxophonists. And now it would be absurd, it would be absolutely strange to assume that Husserl and Walton would want to doubt that this saxophonist is really existing. But what both are in fact trying to do is to develop a perspective from which the differences between, for example, these two images, yeah, are disappear, disappears. They want, from the point of view of Walton and Husserl, these two images are both in the same fictional. In this case, the image, the first aspect we have to differentiate to to understand their opinion, their strange opinion. Both pictures, we can see here, consist of a certain material. Husserl calls this material, this stuff, picture carrier, or the, of Deutsch, Bildträger. Wharton calls this physical aspect of every image props, ja, also unterstützendes Mittel. In this case, the image carrier is paper. I, I do not, I'm talking not of this, I'm talking about the image which is shown by this image. Yes. Um, this image carrier is paper, it's square. In the case of the left image, rectangle. In the case of the right, one can also weight the image carrier to determine how heavy it is. The image carrier is getting older, the paper is yellowing. The image carrier is a physical object. Then, secondly, there is a reference of both pictures, something to which the picture can, that is important, it's not doing it, it can do be related. On the left, it is a real woman, woman. on the right, this is a fictional superhero. Husserl called this real object, this reference, built sujet. 
you can call it denotat too. Bild sujet is a term which is very common in phenomenology. But one can also call it reference of the image. Right? Here we have the difference that the subject exists once and does not exist in the other case. Now, one would probably want to say that the subject, the reference of the image exists, all as in the case of the left-hand image. So we see a non-fictional image, and in the case of the right-hand image, it does not exist. That's the reason why we see a fictional image of Superman. But, and that is now the exciting point, both philosophers, Walton and Husserl, are of the opinion that the fictional character of every image is more fundamental, fundamental. The images from a fiction in any case, even before an image is a fiction, even in the case before we ask what could be a reference of this image. The ex essential fictional character of every image comes from the image object. And that is the third aspect of every image. This image object can be differentiated from the image sujet, the reference, and the image carrier. The image object or picture object that is not differentiated is what you think, and that's important, and that is phenomenology. I only describe my own experience. I would say that it's the only reasonable way in philosophy. Yeah? And the picture object is what you think you see now. It is what you think you see there on this wall. And the image object, the picture object, is on the left side a black and white figure. Black and white. And of course, Georgia Schalmers, this real musician in London, is not a black and white woman. No, but the image object, what you can see here. And the image object on the left side is a colorful image object. And this image object is in an ontological way very, very interesting and also pinpointed it to the most important characteristic, an image object is a nothing. In an ontological way, it is a nothing. For the picture object exists only for the beholder. Yes, and that is the most important yes, task in the phenomenology of images. What are characteristics of an image object? The image carrier is not very interesting. Don't spend time with it. Yes. And the reference, a uh, physical object. But, and that is the interesting point, the first property, the first characteristic, and the most important characteristic of the image object is that it is pure visibility, reine Sichtbarkeit. It is only visible. You cannot touch Superman or this woman. You can, if you have a photo, of cheese, the cheese is not smelling. And the second characteristic is that the physics is not constraining the object. That is the reason why we can see objects which are not in a physical sense possible in the world. Yes, and the most important thing is where you can find this character is the image object is not getting older. George Chalmers, this real musician, is at the moment actually a little bit older than on this. Yes. And Mona Lisa, this woman we can see on this painting, is not 500 years old. Yeah. Hans Jonas aptly described what is visible in a picture as lifted out of the causal intercourse of things. Aus dem Kausalzusammenhang der Dinge. Das ist großartig. That's a sort of Befreiung. Yeah? Image object cannot be illuminated from the side. Of course, if I open this door, you get illuminated, yes? but not Georgia Schalmers. That's different. You cannot see it from the left side and the right side. And that's strange. You see me more left, you see me more right, but you do not see Georgia Schalmers more right as you see. Yeah, imagine you go to a James Bond film and you sit, sit in there, left side, and then you say after the show, oh, tomorrow I go once again in a James Bond film, but I look from the right side. Yes, it, it is not possible. And that is the interesting point. The picture object is not seen in different perspective. It is befreit aus der Kausalität. And now we can understand the reason why Walton and Husserl were of the opinion 
that every image is qua image a fiction. These two pictures here, Chalmers and Superman, do not show a real woman or a fictional character, but what they show is equally a picture object. And this picture object, which is not constrained by physics, is a fiction. And that means the image theory today, the concept of showing, is used to describe the relation between build trigger and build object or image carrier and picture, or, um, and picture object. When ein, ein Philosoph sagt, das Bild zeigt Superman, yeah, dann meint er damit, auf dem Bild wird etwas sichtbar. If someone says, this picture shows Georgia Chalmers, it means that an image object, which resembles this woman, is getting visible. Show, and that's strange, because in everyday life we use this concept in another way, show, also the term show or showing, means here not um, that I take a reference to an object anywhere in the world, but to make something visible. The word show is used in the sense of becomes visible on an image carrier. You have to know it, otherwise you wouldn't understand the text by Husserl or Walton. And that is an exciting point. Images are not representation. Walton or Husserl never would say an image is a representation. And that's right to say an image is a representation. This is strange. This is rubbish. Yes? And an image is a presentation because you get presented an object which is not constrained by physics. And that is a typical opinion of the image theory from Husserl to Walton, or one example in the mid center, in the middle of the century, by Jean-Paul Sartre. Jean-Paul Sartre, an example, a quotation, the painter, quotation by Sartre, does not want to paint signs on the canvas. And that's his point. We, you very often can hear that images are signs. No, images are not signs. They can be used as a sign, but every object in the world can be used as a sign. So it's totally langweilig to deal with images as signs. The painter does not want to paint signs on the canvas. He wants to create a thing. And that's the act of painting, to create a thing. Yeah? It formed and regard colors and sounds as uh, But if the painter, still the quotation, you will say, make houses exactly. He makes them, that is, he creates an imaginary or fictionless house on the painting, quote, end. It would like, I would like to defend this very common view in image theory. So my point is, perhaps you find a philosopher who is not, we always find a philosopher, but that's really the mainstream in image theory in the 20th century. Yeah? And from this point, now we understand an image is defined as an image by producing an object, and this object is a picture object, and quotation Edmund Husserl, quote, the pictorial object is a fictum. So, now we have the conclusion, every image has to be a fiction, because an image is nothing other as a Produktionsstätte von Fiktionalität. Any work is function, uh, any um, work of images are fictional, is a quotation by Walt, and so you will see we have the same opinion. So that does not mean that every image is showing a Superman or a phantom. One of the, the beliebtesten metaphors, one of the very favorite metaphors for image objects by Günther Anders, by Ingarden, was phantom, phantom. Günther Anders, this famous pupil of Husserl, always would say, yeah, we have two phantoms, but he's not thinking that every image is showing them guys, the ghost, the strange object. Yeah? Every image is a phantom. For example, this photo of the musician, well, uh, Georgia Sharma, because a phantom is not constrained by the laws of physics. And that is the point where Husserl tries to get more precise. Husserl is giving, in his descriptions, a differentiation between two forms in which a person is able to see what is nothing, just take an imagination. 
per absolute axis you will have born in the 600 after after uh, this born and perhaps you lived on a bench place in a wood it could happen that you never ever have seen an image in your life today it's nearly impossible to live a life without seeing an image but what, what does it mean it means that you ever seen objects which really existed which really existed by the invention of images uh, the phenomena that you can see something which is not real is getting into the world of human beings and Husserl saw that this is possible in two ways uh, that is the most important differentiation between fiction on the one hand and illusion on the other hand a wax figure a wax figure in Madame to Madame Tussaud, cabinets of Madame Tussaud, for example. A wax figure is a masterpiece of illusion, and parts of the panorama we saw yesterday are illusions. A wax figure is a wax work, quotation by, by Husserl, is an illusion. But an image is not an illusion, because you have here the way that you see something which is not present at the moment where you're looking at, but you see that it's not existing there. If you take one example back here, here, no one says, hello, Georgia, can you play saxophone to me? No one says, oh, there is really. We see that we see something which is not present in a real sense, and I would say which is present in an artificial sense what we can call artificial presence. And now we have the possibility to differentiate two forms of non-existing visibility. Here, one of the yes, highlights of the Renaissance, a famous painting by Giovanni Bellini from 1488. It's in Venice, in the Frari church. And if you see here, Mary with the uh, Jesus child, it's a normal painting. Of course, no one would say, Hello, Mary, oder die Hegel sagt, die Knie, das ist vorbei. Yeah? No one. But the interesting part of this image is the frame. Because the frame is painted too. But the frame, I think, as far as I, if you have the same experience as I have, I think the frame is real. It's a frame by, made by wood. No. This frame is an illusion. Yes, it's an illusion, and Mary is a fiction. And that is an interesting point. Now, we have the reason why it's so common to call every image and fiction in image theory in the 20th century. And now, we have a tool, an instrument, uh, yeah, a conceptual true tool to get more precise if we want to talk about images and especially about photography. From the point of view of hang on. From the point of view of Husserl and Wharton, there is no difference between these two images. And that is from an everyday point of view strange. Because in everyday life, correct me if you don't speak in this way, we don't use the concept of showing for the relation between image carrier and image object. We use the concept of showing for the relation of image object and image today. Imagine you are selling an object by eBay. Yes, and yes, you get what you show when you send the image object to it. Yeah, it would be strange. Of course, no. Yeah, and we have to differentiate between the everyday language and the language which is used in philosophy since 120 years. In the image subject exist, the image is used as a non-fictional sign. That is an interesting point. We have an image object which is getting visible on an image carrier that has nothing to do with a sign. A sign is taking a reference. But the, it, to be an image is more fundamental than to be a sign. And we can use an image object as a sign, and that's important, not the image carrier. If we use images as signs, 
exercise, we are not using image carriers, we are using image objects in order to take reference to an object which is resembling. So we can take the left image, yeah, the image object, for example, to take reference to this musician, and this musician is not black and white, but the image object is black and white. And we could try to do it with the right one, but this guy is not existing. And that means, for example, we can say, on the left hand, we have an image of James Bond in Liebeskusser of Moscow, what is it, Mustang, or last meetings from Moscow, or similar. And on the right side, Sean Connery in the 1963. The same image can be used as a sign for different objects, because no image is a sign by being an image, it's always used, and we have to learn how to use it, and the title of an image is very, very important. So we can take this, both images, if, of course, we say, yes, we see an extraterrestrial being yeah, on the left hand, or we see Dora Ma. Yeah? We can use it to take or construct a reference. And from this point of view, that no image is assigned by being an image, but getting a sign in a way that we use to take a reference by resemblance between the image object and the image sujet, by this, in front of this background, I think it's quite interesting to think about photography and especially about digital photography. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, it seems to me that the time has come to point out that the question of fictional images becomes considerably more complicated, but also more considerably more exciting when we come to talk about photography, what Husserl and Wharton not, yes, hardly ever do. Yeah? The photography, in fact, is a particular image in which the image subject is one of the causes uh, that is causally responsible for the fact that there is an image object on the image carrier. That's quite simple. That is this relation. That is the relation. You have an image subject, for example, Dr. Chalmers, a woman. She is standing in front of a camera, and the sujet is one of the Ursachen dafür, the image subject is one of the causes that the image carrier is so as it is. Of course, it's a causal reaction, physical reaction. The image carrier has a quality, that's a phenomenological aspect. If you look on it, if you hold it, you get the impression you see something, an image object, but it's not a real woman. But it's not a real woman. You never ever see a real woman. You see an image object which resembles an object in the world. The image object is visible to the image carrier, and this image object has similarity with the image subject. That is the structure in which a photo is working. That's the structure. And that means, it's interesting, there is a priori, and I have to say, I think only what is a priori is interesting in the world, there is a priori no such thing as fictional photography. It cannot exist at all. Because if you have a photograph of something, then this something has existed. It has to be in front of a, in a it has a part of a causal reaction. Yeah? It must have existed because only something real in the world can be a cause that physically determines the appearance of the image carrier. And that means we can make a difference. Yeah. We can say, the left hand, you see a photo of Sean Connery, because all Sean Connery, the actor, was standing in front of the camera. <laughs> On the right hand, you see an image of James Bond. There is no photo of James Bond existing. It's only an image existing. I, for example, am a father of twins, looking absolutely resembling. They take uh, the, a passport from, it doesn't matter which passport, or the student card, yes, because they're using the same photo as image. And they say, yes, the passport only has an image. Yes, it's so important. Look to your passport, what is written there? Pinpoint, photo on image. 
If there's written an image, you can take it from your twin brother or twin sister. If there's written a photo, you have to take your own real one. The photo of something is always itself a physical trace of that something and therefore cannot be a fictional because fictional things leave no physical traces. There is no way contradicts Husserl. He is right. All pictorial objects are fictions, ontologically speaking, a nothing. But the pictorial objects in photographs are perspective fictor shown by the image carrier caused by a real thing in the world. And, that, and with this consideration, a perspective seems to open up that is very decisive for the current world of images. I can put it this way. The distinction between fiction and illusion, you remember the distinction between fiction and illusion, Bellini, yeah, which Husserl introduced and which is so useful for describing images, nowadays returns in a completely different form in the modern media world. Increasingly, in the modern media world, we are dealing with images that are a kind of illusion. Images are a kind of illusion, but not of a thing, but of a media. And that, I think, is a new step at the moment. We are not dealing with images or uh, illusion of things, but of media. Come back to this image. Oh, no, we haven't shown. That's Bambili. You know him? Yes, Bambili. The main character from the Transformers comic. On the left side, you have a panel from this comic. On the right side, you have a still from Transformers 3. Also, of course, in neither of the pictures here does the machine look like it is here now. No one thinks this machine is in this room, otherwise it would be strange. None of you are afraid of these things because you don't need to be afraid of picture objects. Picture objects can't be dangerous. But, and this is important now, what we see here looks like a photograph. That is not true for the comic sheet. I want to show that we have the differentiation between illusion and fiction now on the media level, on the other level. Yeah? The illusion of the right, right image does not concern the image object. Otherwise, you have to say, oh, there's Bumblebee. Yeah? But you don't think that there's Bumblebee. The illusion concerns the media. One has an illusion of seeing a photograph, although there is no photograph. The medium of the painting is as visually indistinguishable. Oh, that was a schwer word. This says. <laughs> you can't differentiate from a photograph. As Bellini's painting, you can't differentiate Mary from the columns. Of course, it does not come to the illusion that a beholder of the picture believes that the machine is in the room. The phenomena which we are now dealing, and I would say in a creasing way, is a form of media illusion. In view of digital photography, a phenomenon known from art history as photorealism, is repeating itself. One thinks of these two images. The right one is one of my favorite images. It's a huge painting by Franz Gertsch from 1970. And on the right, uh, no, on the left hand, it's incredible. It's a ballpoint, uh, ballpoint pen drawing. Kugelschreiberzeichnung by Oskar Ukonu. These pictures are not photographs. Both images are not photographs, but a drawing and a painting. The viewing of which is associated with the viewing is that they give an illusion of seeing a photograph. This means that we have three cases in which a picture can look like a photograph. Three cases in which a picture can look like a photograph. Left hand, right hand, 
yeah, Ukuno and Gersh, uh, we have a photograph which is looking like a photograph, but it's not a photograph, and in the middle we have a photograph, and it is a photograph. And now we have the situation that this sort of media treatment is mixed up. Yes? So the problem, to pinpoint it, of dealing with digital photography is not so on the, on the image object. It's in the illusion effect of the image carrier. That's a problem. The image carrier is getting an illusion of photography. The drawing is an example of photorealism, and the transformer's image is an example of what we can call photoillusionismus. Photorealismus is it's well known by art history, a photo, and photo illusionismus. You think, yet you see a photo as in the form of illusion, but you cannot prove that it's not a photo. You can do so much as you want. Yeah, you, can, you can't have any physical method to identify the right object as a non-photo. This illusion that one is dealing with a photograph, although it is, and that's my proposal, a form of digital painting is a media illusion. And that's the reason why, from my point of view, it would be a huge step forward if we stop calling digital photography, digital photography, we should call it digital painting. It's a form of digital painting with the illusion to be a trace of an object in the world. Yeah, that's the point. Like, if you were, uh, we have a situation now, uh, I start here again, this illusion that one is dealing with a photograph, although it is a digital painting, is a media illusion that leads to images that are ideally suited to justify the alleged true of deliberately false statements. If I would try to prove my opinion that Bumblebee is really existing in New York, and you never have been, I said, no, I saw him. I, I have a photo, I have an image. I could not take yeah, a drawing from a panel of a comic, but this form of images could be used to prove a statement. And that is now the interesting point. Then you could use a real photo as evidence. Of course, we use real photos of evidence. If I want to prove that you drove too quick to the streets, you have this photo by the police, or if I have a photo where you're standing with a knife, and you have a photo, yeah, a lot of murders are überführt by photography. We use photos as proof for our Proposals, well, sorry, propositions, because we have a trace between the image, photo, and what was happening in the world. And now we have this weird phenomena, and it, I, from my point of view, it's getting bigger and bigger and huger and huger, that we have images which are the illusion of traces, but they are not traces. It is never the picture, never ever the picture lie. Yeah? Because pictures never claim or say something, a picture is not saying something. That's rubbish. In German, we have this word, ein Bild sagt mehr als tausend Worte. Absoluter Quatsch. Bilder sagen überhaupt nichts. Und obendrein sind tausend Worte auch gar nicht viel. Ja? Ich weiß gar nicht, warum man davon beeindruckt sein soll. Tausend Worte sind ja nicht viel. Pictures don't say more than thousand words, either, which, by the way, are not many words. Because pictures talk and don't claim anything. Despite the knowledge that what we see here looks like a photograph, but it is not a photograph at all, despite the knowledge of the possibility of being deceived with manipulated photographs, the illusion of photography also has the reality effect of an experience. A phenomenal approximation occurs. The media illusion leads to non-photographs, like photographs, being experienced as traces of a reality. This is only possible with photographs. There is no such thing as a fictional photograph, but there is the illusion that something is a photograph. And I think that is a perspective of images in, the, in times of KI or AI. It is this phenomenon which becomes a particular challenge in image generated, images generated by an artificial intelligence. The character that they are believed to be photographs, although they are paintings, not by humans, but paintings by computers. There is much 
Yeah, uh, there is a much discussed example. You all know it was one of the first examples of the Pope in this interesting jacket. Yeah? And that cannot be decided by examining the image. You could not bring this image into a laboratorium. Yeah? You cannot decide it. And that is producing a new situation. But, and that's my last point today, it's producing a new situation which is about very well known from our spoken language. From our spoken language. If Jakob, if you would say now to me, I saw, um, I saw a rabbit on the street. Just by saying this sentence, I cannot decide is it true or not true. Why should I say there was a rabbit when Jakob says to me there was a true rabbit? What, what is the reason to say? Die Vertrauenswürdigkeit. It's Jakob. I think Jakob, yes, the guy I believe. Yeah. We have, to, if we want to know a sentence is true, yeah, we have to believe into the person. That is a very traditional situation. Yeah. If you go on a home page, what is the reason to believe what is in the internet? Yeah? It's just the situation we have from the spoken language. And with the introducing digital photography, we bring the photograph or the image into a situation which was always a situation in the spoken language. And this gives digital images in a particular and a, sp a special significance for the formation of fictions in the contemporary world. Because fictional image objects are produced that look like traces of real things without being so. It might be difficult to escape this danger of creating illusions through images. The only thing that help, helps is a knowledge that the so-called digital photographs are not photographs at all. We have an example of when misnaming, and I think it was really a huge mistake, that at the beginning of digital photographs, we did not decide ourselves to call them digital paintings. We have an example of when misnaming can have disastrous social and uh, so, uh, social consequences. It would have been a, a thousand times better if so-called digital photography had been called what it is, digital paintings that look like photography but is not a photography. Then we would, from the starting point, have the situation which we have by paintings. And then we have the painting of Napoleon. Why should you believe that this painting is showing Napoleon the way he should? Just by believing into the painter. We have the same situation. And then a linguistic cat categorization would have been made, if we would call digital photography, digital painting, which is helpful not to believe statements proven by pictures. Thank you for your opening. Thank you very much, Lambert, for this, uh, wow, amazing presentation. Uh, we've got a lot of time for discussion. And I will be selfish, uh, Chairman, and let myself to ask a first <laughs> question this time. Uh, in reference to those examples uh, with James Bond and, and Picasso's portrait of, portrait of women, uh, I would like to ask, what do you think about answer uh, given by Hilary Putnam is his, in his famous uh, essay, uh, yeah. Brains on That? Uh, you remember there is this story about the ant yeah, walking on the, on the sand and uh, by accident drawing the picture, yeah. the portrait cartoon of Winston Churchill. Yes, yes, <laughs> it's nice. Yeah. <laughs> the Patman asks, uh, does the ant draw the picture of, uh, of Churchill or not? And yeah. his answer is not because it didn't have, uh, have yeah. such an intention to do yes. it. And yes. generally his answer is that the most important thing that some object can represent another is yes. the intention of yes. representation. Yes. I, I'm aware it's an um, epistemological answer, not ontological one, but what do you think about such yes. an approach? Indeed. I think uh, Putnam is working with this, um, with this opinion that every image is a representation. For representation it is necessary to have an intention. An aunt does not have an intention, so it cannot be a representation. So as it far as we know. 
Wie? As far as we know. Huh? As far as we know, the ant doesn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As <laughs> far as we know. Correctly. Yeah. So take the situation an ant has no intention, then it can't be a representation. I agree absolutely. But by the precondition that an image is a representation, he had to say that it's not an image. But I would say it's absolutely wrong. Images are not representations. They can be used as representation. So from my point of view, the situation at this beach is that the ant is doing something which ha produced an object which can be seen by a beholder. Perhaps these beholders are only human beings. We do not know what this dog uh, can. Yes. But by a beholder as an image. Because images are not representations, they are presentations. Are you convinced by this answer? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> Actually, I think that uh, Putnam probably could agree yeah. Yeah, as well. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. I, I thought that was an absolutely amazing lecture. Thanks so much. Um, it was great to listen to. And I really enjoyed uh, the way that you developed the ideas of Husserl, specifically with regard to photography. And I think that you identified something that is obviously of crucial importance at the moment in the world, which is the way in which the illusion of photography can be dangerously manipulated. And I think it makes it a very crucial thing. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to sort of look at it a little bit more closely because you talk about digital photography and my personal view is that digital photography is a true form of photography in that... Is it what form? A true form of photography in that the, uh, the structure that you illustrated about yeah. the nature of a photograph, it is, it is followed by digital photography in that that arrow at the top does exist in digital photography. And I think it's very, in, 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 in other words, the um, image, the, uh, let me get this straight. <laughs> what ends up on the image carrier is a direct consequence of the existence of the thing that is being presented ultimately by the picture subject, in other words, the, oh, the picture object, in other words, the picture subject. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. Um, and I think it's very important to distinguish between that and the product of artificial intelligence image making, for instance, or CGI that's done in a computer. I mean, uh, artificial pictures, pho artificial photographs or, or images masquerading as photographs are not new to AI. They've been being done obviously in the movies for quite a long time. It's quite interesting that you use that example from the Transformers. I do think that that kind of image is very distinct from digital photography, true digital photography of the sort that we're seeing happening in the room all the time and on people's phones. Mm. Because with CGI or with AI, mm, yes. that top arrow is either not there at all, or it's broken. Yes, yes you're, you're absolutely right. I, I think and I can agree, and I think you, you are giving an interesting conceptual um, proposal to talk about true digital photography and digital photography, which I would call digital paintings. I agree with you. You can still, uh, you can, can go on, use uh, digital photography, and a lot of people are doing it with their cell phones at the moment, or here, this object there, in the form of a traditional photograph. But it's quite common, at least in philosophy, if we talk about media, that we are only interested, but perhaps it's wrong, but I'll just a little defend of my way of speaking, is that in, in media theory, it's quite common just to talk about what is new in the media. Not, I agree, yes. Yes, <laughs> what is new. And in this sense, and so perhaps I if you allow, I make it to my own. True digital photography is traditional photography, and we can use it. But it's beginning to get slippery slope. Yes, we have to believe in, this, in the producer. Yeah? Uh, can I be sure that you don't manipulate your, your images? Yeah, look, look. <laughs> yeah and, and actually, I, I did want to sort of carry on the discussion about this, because I think it's very important. I mean, part of the point of true digital photography now yeah whether it's on your phone or a DSLR or something else, is it, it, it makes it much easier for the user yes. to manipulate the photograph in a way that was much more cumbersome in the days of, of celluloid photography. Yes. But actually, actually the, the reality of the situation is ever since the birth of photography, people have been manipulating images. And I think what's really interesting about that 
is that there is a, a received idea that we have about photography. Because of that structure, funnily enough, because we believe in that top arrow, and that manipulation that has always happened in photography, and is so much easier now and more widespread with digital photography, is a dangerous thing. And I think one of the things I take from your amazing lecture is somehow people need to become more savvy about the, the, this received idea that when they see an image that appears to be a photograph, that it is therefore true. Yes. And that's what you call, we have a belief, that was your, your uh, term, we have a belief in photography. That is what I would call, we have a concept of photography. And I was dealing with a concept. I know we have manipulation since we have photography. But I never ever would say that this technique of analog photography, yeah, this traditional photography, was produced, invented, yeah, in order to produce a manipulation. It was not the, it is not the perfect tool for this. You can use it in this way. But with the digital photography, we have this huge step that the images are getting very close to spoken language. Because <laughs> if you say something to me, what, what could be a reason for me to believe you? What could be just seriosity? Yeah? I, I can it. It's different if you are talking with your best friend or with an unknown guy. And that is the situation we have to learn that we are now getting in a very quick way, and on a very quick way, a lot of digital paintings in the world. And especially I think it's important for the youth yeah, to learn that we are not surrounded by, by photographs. We are surrounded by, by paintings. Yeah, we, we sh I think it's important to, to learn that the situation in our media world should be similar to the situation in the Louvre. Yeah, there we are, we know we have a painting of a lot of people, no one knows <laughs> did they really look at it. So we should not learn to take an image on Instagram or wherever as a false image, we should learn as, as a right painting. Yes. So with this, this moral aspect is turning into a competence aspect. Was it understandable? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yes, it's, it's the illusion of photography. We've got to let go of that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Ah. Th thank you very much for this uh, thought-provoking lecture. Um, oh, no. I have two. I have two. Uh, Provocative? Yes. No. I, <laughs> I have two questions. I have two questions. Um, exactly, on kind of linking it with with thought-provoking and actually with mental images. So the kind of if. If we follow this train of thoughts, that this is the, there is this kind of concept of if this distinguish um, part of of recognition and of the kind of, of of believing in this what what somebody is showing me, it's really the sense of kind of belief. What role do the mental images which I have already of something play in this? That I can um, following your example that I can I'm seeing something. So in German, like, was sich zeigt, that's what I'm seeing is different from this, what I'm expecting, Mona Lisa in Louvre looking out. So it's kind of something different. So I'm making, my expectation doesn't match this, what, what I'm yeah. seeing. So that's the that's first part of the question. Sorry, I skipped to the second because I know I will not but have but, to. But uh, uh, we, I try to answer and then you give the second, if it's really an other. Sorry? I first try to answer your first Perfect. question. Perfect, okay. Yeah. What exactly do you think is a mental image? This what I have, if you tell me to imagine that, well, to, to think of the bumblebee. Yes. And you ask all of us in the, yeah. kind of in, here in the room, we close our eyes and we think of bumblebee. Yes. What is coming into it? Yes. Yeah, I know, I know. And now what is the problem with this imagination of bumblebee and this description of images? that probably every single one of us will be having completely different vision of it. So the sense of not, believing... Not really. Imagination, not vision. Imagination through vision, yes, yes, that's... That's the point. Because vision is public. We can talk, yeah? And if I say, yes, he's wearing a red jacket, he's wearing a red jacket, he would say, no, I'm crazy. We can, it's, it's, a, it's, it's coming, that's vision. And if I say, yes, he has two weapons, no, he has one weapon. So, yes, but that's kind of that's in terms of recognition. But if you ask me about, uh, I don't know, let's visualize in our head yes. 
who was the one who was not so fast? Sorry, James Bond kind of uh, trivia knowledge. The one uh, who played only once James Bond. If we try to kind of to, uh, to uh, oh, congratulations! <laughs> <laughs> so if we if if we're trying to visualize exactly this or kind of yes this person, and you show me the picture of somebody else yes. So my projection of yeah. the kind of, of how it's yes. supposed to be, and it's it's just basically uh, somebody you know wearing yeah. as well the kind of good cut tuxedo and yeah. kind of and and a revolver. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is the sense. This is making the sense of believing or not. Yes. yes, that's right. But that's not the sense of the visibility of the image. And I was talking about the visibility of the image. Okay, so only on the... On the visibility. The other aspects, I'm not sure whether they can describe as a method of phenomenology or just by psychology. And psychology is, is an so empirical, it's yeah, it's empirical stuff, it's not interesting. Okay, and second question, if I may, is about the kind of the moments of, of, of the kind of mediality. You, you mentioned yeah. mediality a few, few times. The, the moments where all of this kind of construction of illusion is kind of starts breaking, where it's kind of some of the... Uh, this interesting moment where kind of how do I recognize that yeah, yes. what, what again what triggers my sense of believing I really kind of want to where do I kind of start not believing that this is the, 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 the right image or that somebody is telling me the picture which somebody is showing me if the kind of is it within the it's not Bill Trager in this sense when something yeah. medially starts when the apparatus stop working correctly when it starts producing some pixels in between because the yes. uh, where where does it kind of sit? Is it? Do I understand you correctly? If I would translate your question into the form, what is the reason why I can see an image object on the image carrier? Is that your question? No. Where do I recognize that this is just the kind of the, the, the moments of breaking of the kind yeah. of, of, of of showing? Where do I recognize that that this is just? Uh. It just appears there that it's kind of it's it's just a kind of, it's just a constructed image. Oh, if this okay. is uh... no, I understand. Yeah. So please allow me that I personally, if I if you ask me, I would say no one knows it. Yes, it's it's a miracle yeah? because this step from the image carrier, which is a physical object, to the image object is a step from physics to mental image, mental phenomena, and no person on this earth knows the connection between physics and man mental phenomena. You have a lot of stories and history, but forget it all. We do not know. We do not know why we have consciousness. Why we have consciousness. That's the point. But if you look into the history, I have to say that Husserl has his own theory why we are able to see an image object, which is not a real object. And that is a theory of contradiction. He has an opinion that if you go to the the normal image, the normal image, whatever that is, take this again, or, yeah, take here, uh, Christina, the daughter of Franz Gersh, and he would say, in the first moment, you see, you see this woman, you see this woman, and you believe that there is a woman, and the frame, and the outside, which you also see, is a contradiction, Widerspruch, that is his famous term, which produced this strange consciousness of seeing what you think that there is not existing. Because indeed, indeed if you, what, what is seeing? Seeing is the, uh, the consciousness of something which is present to me. Seeing is the consciousness of something which is present to me. And now we say, oh, I see Christina, but Christina is not present. Sartre, for example, says, so, we can't say, I see Christina, I imagine her. And so we have a lot of uh, theories how we can describe or explain or make it considerable why we see an object which is not existing. That's the history. If you take my personal opinion, don't try to answer this question. Yeah? You never ever will find an answer. Because it's a, it is a step from physics to the mental. We don't know. We should agree. We, do, we I do not know why I have perceptions. It's an it's a it's a horrible imposition. I can I was I was never ever asked. Yes, to have now I have to live on Earth with this with this situation that I have. Don't you think that's an imposition? Yes. yes. But 
And that's the interesting point, and that's the reason why I ever ever would underline phenomenology. Phenomenology is a claim to describe how it is to live with this sort of impositions, how it is to be a human being in the world. And to be a human being, or to be Dasein, as Heidegger would say, because that what we say is not only true for human beings, it's true for consciousness, <laughs> is constrained by characteristics. And I try to pinpoint these characteristics which I have to experience because I am subject with consciousness. Yeah, that's my opinion. Uh, I have a, one more question. Uh, if it goes well, about ah, opposite sides, uh, from a project to the final uh, something what, what creates uh, from the project. Uh, if we have project with measurements, a real 3D uh, uh, statement, uh, how from the point of view of phenomenology, uh, how uh, it would be described as a picture still? Yeah, that's... Uh you, you think it's 3D objects, re really 3D objects, or just virtual objects on a screen? 3D, 3D objects with uh, measurements, ah. and then uh, uh. following to the real, uh, yes. real product, yes. actually. Yeah, that's, that is it's a very interesting point, because you, you are in this situation, which, is, which we are confronted with new media, in the same situation we were when Husa was talking about images and the difference between a sculpture, a sculpture and an image. And the sculpture is quite difficult because one of the characteristics of an image is that you can't see it from left and right. You cannot see Christina more left or right. Yes, you can go wherever you want. But of course, you can go around the sculpture. So the sculpture uh, is it's it's always difficult, and, 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 and from my point of view, you, a lot of uh, philosophers who worked on sculpture, the difference to, to images, have different opinions. There are a lot of philosophers who say, yeah, they, are, they are an opposite, they are something else, because you can walk about around. And there are philosophers who say, no, they have one huge property in common, and that is that you can see something which is get, getting older. For example, if you have a sculpture produced by a 3D printer or produced in marble by a Bildhauer uh, and take, take David from Michelangelo, this, uh, this guy is still 22 or 20, whatever, the same situation as Mona Lisa. Yeah? It's not getting older. And if you say the characteristic, the main property of an image, and we are dealing with the question, what is an image, not what is art? Art is uninteresting because no one knows what is art. Yes. So, uh, what is an image? Then the main characteristic is, is broken with physics. You, you, you have to experience something which is not possible in the sense of physics. And by the laws of physics, every object in this world is getting older. Unfortunately, we too. Yes. It's getting older. But only, and that's so interesting, and I think that is from the most important for human beings. Only by images you can see objects which are not getting older. And that is not so long existing in our history. Yes, yes I gave this example that you, for example, you, you imagine you were born in the 6th century in a strange situation. <laughs> it could happen that you, have, you never ever saw an, saw an image. Yeah? You could perhaps see the reflection on a lake, but a reflection on a lake is not an image. An image because this reflection, what you see, is getting older. Yeah? Of course, you do not see an image in a mirror. No. And if you are driving a car and you look in your, your mirror, I personally never ever would stop for an image, but I stop for another car, of course, because I see the reflection of a real car. You see real cars. As long as you see real objects, you are not confronted with, with images. So my answer is to your 3D object. We have to look at it, and if you think that everything you see is constrained by physics, it's not an image. If you say, no, there are aspects which are deliberated by, from physics, then you start, it's starting to get an image. Okay, thank you for your answer. And do you agree? 
I would no say 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 me. I'm interested in your opinion. Uh, I, I was thinking about because here we have a, a real thing yeah. close to the image. Uh, the sculpture is still the image of something uh, existing in natural uh, yeah. our our environment actually. But uh, here, if uh, an artist is making a project, for example, a chair chair project, we have three D chair project, and then this chair is produced uh, yeah. to something physical. Yes. And that was was my question actually, how the the phenomenology phenomenology would yeah. think about the project goes to physical product later. Yes. But wouldn't you agree that this in this project a real chair is produced, not an image of a chair? Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's because on images you can't sit, on chairs you can sit. Yes, yes, yes. So, so that that's yeah. uh, that's a good answer for me. <laughs> Thank you.